the director of the museum, and we're delighted to have this little special um, gallery talk um, that is uh, going to share some highlights of, with the exhibition of Roland Reese's. We do have some of Roland's family members here. Unfortunately, he was not well enough to travel to come to the reception, so we keep him in our, um, in our heart and spirit and mind um, as we celebrate his incredible work. We're really delighted to have um, this exhibition here. And I, oh, Rhonda. Rhonda is the curator. Rhonda Goffer, will you say hello? Yeah. <laughs> I didn't think she was here, but she just walked in. So we will be expecting a few more people, though it's almost 20 after 4. So I don't want to take up too much time because we only have until about 5. So I'd like to introduce Nancy K. Turner. Um, she, she, was, um, she was Roland's um, choice to, uh, to, to do this because she wrote a review and I think he just is enamored with her writing and her work. Um, yes. That's awesome, right? Yeah. And, um, and Nancy is also a professor at the Glendale Community College. She's an artist in her own right and also um, is, a, is a critic and a writer for many of the uh, regional art, art reviews. An artist. And an artist, I did say, yes, she is an artist in her own right. Exactly. So um, without further ado, um, Nancy K. Turner. Yay. Thank you. Thank and for you anyone who's just arrived, we do have champagne. Please um, drink heartily and enjoy yourself. So I was going to say I'm delighted to be here, which I really am, because uh, Roland's work is amazing, and I'm delighted that he, he liked my review. But also, I'm really delighted to be here, because I was in New Orleans up until Thursday. So uh, I was so afraid I wouldn't make it. But anyway, since we, we have a short period of time, I wanted to talk about one of the things about reviewing art, and the reason I like to do it as an artist, is because it makes you slow down and look. Because otherwise, you, even though it's beautiful, you look through it in 15 or 20 minutes and you're out the door. So one of the things I thought was very uh, poignant, pointed, and telling about Roland Reese's choice of titles is he called this unrepentant, and unapologetic flowers. Now, what do flowers have to be apologetic about, right? Well, beauty, right? And why is that a situation? Because in the last 40 or 50 years in art, beauty has been kind of a dirty word. I mean, art is about theory, it's about text, it is not supposed to be about beauty. So in a sense, when Roland Reese is saying unrepentant, it's like I was born in the Bronx. It's like he's saying, oh yeah? <laughs> no, I'm gonna give you something to think about. So I'm gonna start here and, and have you start uh, looking at these. And I wanted to, to explain some things that I found when I looked at them. Um, you notice that they're all almost in a sense identical structurally. And that's because um, Roland Reese through these flowers is taking us through the history of art. And one of the places he's starting is with serial imagery, S-E-R-I-A-L imagery. Serial imagery was started with, by Monet when he decided to work with a haystack rather than haystacks. So when you work with serial imagery, you have a specific structure. So the paintings are the same size, the composition is identical, you the artist are the same amount of space away from whatever it is you're working with, and so in the case of Monet, only the light, the season, or the weather changed his, what he saw and hence changed the color. So these are in that mold of serial imagery. They're not identical, but they're nearly identical. The figures are central. They don't touch the bottom. There's no sense of space in a sense. Each of these flowers is embedded in the background. And then the more you look at them, you realize that his painting style, he's putting the painting on in a very flat and unmodulated way. And the edges are really crisp. Well, that's called hard edge painting. In the 1960s, there were two movements. One was hard edge painting, and that was because artists uh, made the switch over from oil paint to acrylic. And one of the things acrylic could do is it dried quickly and you could get this great edge. 
And so people started painting really large and they started using masking tape and it became about shape and edge. So if you look at these, it's shape and it's edge. So he's referring not only to serial imagery, but he's also referring to the uh, 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 op art and pop art painting of the 1960s. And also when you look at some of these, you see, like, you know, I was trained as a painter, so you basically, his paintings are so gorgeous you want to lick them. I mean, it's always so <laughs> seen. So there, there's this beautiful pink edge here. If you look at it quick, uh, closely, you'll see a vibrancy and that in each of these sections, that these, they're almost totally like abstract painting. So they're absolutely gorgeous. And he's a masterful colorist. I mean, they're, they're, they're really something. Then we get to why flowers, and why are flowers so disregarded? Just a little bit about when, we, when I was trained, there was a hierarchy. Painting was the top, then there was sculpture, then there was maybe printmaking, then there was drawing, then there were the crafts, right? And then within the, the hierarchy of painting, there was uh, portraits, like power portraits of kings, et cetera, landscape, genre paintings, which were interiors, self-portraits. He worked uh, religious painting, historical painting, legend, myth, and at the bottom was still life. And at the bottom of still life was floral arrangement. Now think about that. Because, is it because it's feminine? When you think of flowers, they are kind of, you know, people have associated them with, with women. Uh, is it because maybe Sunday painters like to paint flowers? So it's like, it was a disregarded um, art form in a sense. I mean, there were great people like Henry Fantana Tour who did flowers. I mean, obviously Georgia O'Keeffe, she just made her flowers really big and eroticized and in your face. <laughs> so she, it was like, they weren't that little female flower. They were very, they were aggressively a female and aggressively flower-like. And the other person who took flowers on was Andy Warhol. But he silk screened them so that they were messy. So he silk screened flowers, he made wallpaper of flowers. He definitely, it was like this. It's like the unrepentant flowers and unapologetic flowers is because it's a discussion of beauty. And I found this uh, great quote from this really interesting art critic, Dave Hickey, who's like the bad boy of art history. And he said, to choose beauty over content is sedition. So Raymond, uh, Raymond, Roland knows all of this, and all of this is embedded in his flower paintings. So um, I hope that helped uh, people have an idea of why that title was so important, because he wanted his audience to have that conversation, either with each other or even internally. Uh, so uh, if, you, if, if that's okay with you, we can move on to the small room where there's the, does anyone have any questions about that? Okay, so I'll just see if I left anything important out. But then I'm gonna go into this little room, which is some of the, the tableaus, and they're, they're sort of different. So if you guys can come in over here. <laughs> We're gonna start. One thing I did forget about serial imagery, which is really important, is because um, the paintings are in a sense identical in shape and identical in content, but different in color, um, it eliminates the notion of the masterpiece and also it eliminates the idea of time. So for example, if you look at Picasso's growth, that Picasso has a blue period. That was when he was young. Then he has, uh, does something else. He does collage, so that's 10 years later. So you can see the growth of his work through those changes. But Joseph Albers did serial imagery. He did homage to a square. And, and you could see 100 of them, and you would never know what order they came in. And so that is also true of that particular grouping, is they are interchangeable, because of set theory. 
Okay, so then these, these are something, can you guys come in? You gotta look at these. These are like, these are too good to just hear someone talk about them. So if you haven't been in this room and you haven't taken a look, you need to look at them because they're fabulous. And um, the thing about Roland is that he was a real maverick. In the 1980s, there was a, a, a push to do monumental paintings and really big sculptures. And museums had to get bigger and bigger because the things were enormous. And so, of course, then Roland got little. <laughs> but he got little, but he never got small. His work is packed. They're philosophical. They're psychological. He's essentially a cultural critic. And he's asking you to look at your culture through all these. So, um, uh, like uh, this one is called The Morality Plays, which is from, uh, medieval. There were morality plays, you know, which tell people morality. <laughs> so this is called Repastarium, of course, about food. Food plays a, a big part in his work. But it's very interesting because it's often like uh, fast food. It's pizza, cookies, chocolate, <laughs> hamburgers, beer, soda. It looks like almost a product placement ad in a paper because Coca-Cola makes it, it moves throughout all of these. Then there's also things in gold, like there's a hamburger back there in gold, gilded. So they're basically hilarious, but really serious. So it's just a beautiful balance. Very few people can do that. So they often have a safe with gold bullion in there, which is really always good. Now in the 80s was that time where it was just filled with all these people, with all these young kids were getting out of graduate school, going into investment banking, and making hundreds of thousands of dollars. It's Wall Street, it's Gordon Gecko. It was just you know greedy, 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 greedy. And so a lot of these, to me, reflect, even though some of these are from the 90s, he started these in the 80s, they reflect that cultural change. Um, and so, you know, the thing about these is they're hermetically sealed. They're almost like hot houses, you know. They're not claustrophobic, but the more you look at them, you realize everything is in there. There's always books, but you wonder if the people who live here read them. They're also about absence and presence. And these particular ones, there are no people, only their detritus. So, uh, in this case, it's a chair, but it's just, instead of the person, I'm sorry, it's just filled with sandwiches. And I mean, it's not even like, <coughs> nobody can even eat that sandwich. You couldn't get your mouth around that sandwich. So they're really about acquisition, about greed, very pre-Marie Kondo. You know, this is like, this person needs a couple of giant bags, you know, to, to, you know. Do these things bring joy? I mean, so he's asking all these really interesting questions. Like talk about, this is before there was the stairway to nowhere. Where are your hamburgers leading you? They're just, it's just you're up and down, you're up and down. This is like my weight loss, right? <laughs> up and down, up and down. So they're, they're, so they're wonderful and they're magical. And then, but his sense of humor is so fabulous. I mean, there's a scale there with an apple on it. <laughs> and I mean, and a, and a gold bouillon. But then there's Lay's potato chips, you know. So his craftsmanship is miraculous. It's not just good, it's miraculous. Okay, so let me, let's see what this one has. Oh, I thought this one was particularly interesting. Well, this one is called Morality Plays Planetarium. And so when I was looking at this, it seemed like everything was in flux. It seems like uh, maybe things are about to be placed, but they haven't been placed. Um, and then, uh, you know, this text in these, and so, this text is sincerity, which we could use more of in our lives now, and um, excess, you think. <laughs> wretched, no, he's not wretched, but just excess. And then, fellow, I think it's fellowship. So some of these are things we want, but we don't have. Some of the things we're never gonna have. Um, do we just accumulate things? But also, it was very interesting to me that these were all things that were alive but they were like inside, and they're all meant to be outside. So it was that contradiction. Also, I love that Roland puts his paintings over yes. there. Yeah. <laughs> that is really a great sense of humor. And then this one was, oh, this is, it says, the morality plays, I love his titles, 
liter literatium, you know, so it's always like he's, he makes up these, you know, Greek names that aren't really real, but, you know, we're grounded in Greek philosophy, in Greek, uh, you know, uh, literature, and so, you know, like, what is real? Is this, a, is this is about Plato and Plato's cave, you know? So we have difficulty here. Do we have difficulty reading all our books? Do we have difficulty reading at all? Do we have difficulty, um, this says indulgence. Also, I thought that that was, some of the titles are really interesting. Oh yeah, this was great. So the title here, this is one of the few you can really read. It says, looking out for number one. So it is about that selfish impulse that's sort of been permeating our, our culture. So Roland is a cultural critiquer, and also he's critiquing art history as well with his work. But at the same time, it's like giving it's like giving you almost a bitter pill, but with honey. He makes you laugh, but he's, they're really quite serious and they're quite wonderful. So um, again, it's a stairway to nowhere, but this way it has. But then he always has a little tiny nook, and in this nook also has a can of cocoa. <laughs> so it's like, so um, we can go in, there's an, uh, another painting I want to talk about. Oh, actually right here. today and they like I was joking I told his wife uh, Donna and knocked my socks off you can see I don't have socks <laughs> but so you you take a look at this and the first thing you see the more obvious thing because the flowers are in color and everything else is monochromatic so you see the flowers first you see the beauty but then you notice oh yeah there's a lot of thorns so it's almost like beauty <coughs> and the beast you know pleasure and pain there's always a, there's this Rowan is always trying to reconcile opposites. There's a piece in the back that I think is something called the rec reconciliation of yes and no. So, but then, if you start looking at this more, it becomes more and more hilarious because he's taken figures. This is a little girl with a hoop from a De Chirico painting. That's a little boy with a musical instrument from Manet. Um, that's uh, three figures. I think that's Picasso. This is Matisse, it's his figures. So these are all, this is the wedding. Uh, this is Henri Rousseau, Rousseau when she's on the couch. I forget the title of that. This is a woman from uh, Seurat's Le Grand Jatte. So he's taken individual pictures out of art history and placed them in here. So it's, it's a, it, it, there's always a twinkle in his eye, you know. And uh, so, th they're, and they're absolutely beautiful. It's the same kind of thing, you know, Monet's lilies, except that Roland's lilies are blue. And they're incredibly abstract. And then the more you look at it, you see that there are carp underneath. But you know, there are layers upon layers upon layers. The thing with all of Roland's work is it's like an onion skin. You start to peel away one meaning, you get to another meaning, you get to another meaning. But um, unfortunately, we, we, we very rarely take the time to look at art that way. Um, the amount of time someone, you know, that he even took to paint that one flower people probably don't look at the whole painting, you know, but I know because I, I painted that. So, you know, I mean, the, the delicacy of his line, I mean, he's a master craftsman. <clears throat> I mean, for him to be able to do sculpture and painting, because they're, they're quite different. I was a painter, I'm not anymore, I do mixed media, but I used to joke and say, as a painter, I can paint a door, but I don't have to make it open. But sculptors know how to make it open. And, he, and those are two different kind of spatial things going on in the brain, and he's got both. So uh, he's got this sensual, uh, 
the color sensibility, and he has that, uh, the ability to make all those wonderful pieces. So there's another room with some other pieces, which I had not seen before, but I'm, that doesn't mean I won't talk about them. sensibility, which, which I didn't notice right away until I looked at it. So it's like there's orange, and there's violet, and there's an achromatic one. Um, and then I, w I think I wanted to start with this one, which is kind of this beautiful orange. And, and this one is called FX Events and Effects. And I think this is from the 1990s. And so really, what he's asking here is what's real? It, it's it's all about the movies. And so it's all about props and characters. And of course, none of it is real. It's all made up by him. It comes out of his imagination. But you see the cameras. You see the lights. You see the paint. So it's art about art. But it's also <coughs> what's real and what's not real. And so um, there's this uh, kind of painted backdrop, backdrop. It's almost like instead of a green screen, you can put people in front of that and take a picture that looks like they're on the moon. And of course, in our own time, with uh, uh, all the ways people can manipulate things that we see, like videos, it used to be you could say to people, are you going to believe me or your lion eyes? But now, <laughs> now it's like we can't even necessarily believe our eyes. So he was very prescient with this body of work. He kind of saw where we were going. So again, it's kind of wonderful, and it's there. There are uh, scale shifts and little figures, and so that to me is about reality versus uh, artificiality. This one I thought was very interesting as well because it's a, we're seeing people. I forget what year this one. This one is called Adult Fairy Tales: Language and Myth, and I thought it was very interesting that gray is not a color for people who aren't artists. Black and white aren't colors, uh, they're, they're tones. So when you have black, white, or gray, it's called achromatic, meaning without color. So this is, these people are in a colorless office. And the only people that have color are the, the humans and the plants. But it's very interesting, because we're looking at her looking at them. So it's like an infinity of mirrors. Um, and you can see that they're having some kind of discussion and you can read their, you know, he's like this, which in body language is like, whatever she's saying, he doesn't like it. And then, you know, she's trying to show him the error of his ways and I don't really know what this person is. This is a clearly a third wheel. So again, impeccable craftsmanship. Oh yeah, the only other thing, there's two other things that are in color. One is a yellow pencil, which I love, and the other is a pickaxe. So we can only imagine what the pickaxe might be used for. If he doesn't uncross his arms pretty soon, it's all over for him. So um, then these are also quite beautiful. And this was very interesting. The, a lot of these have to do with absence and presence for me. Um, especially like this one, what's the name here? Oh yeah, the dancing lessons, the reconciliation of yes and no. So I thought this was particularly interesting. There's a cane with a point. Of course, I've been watching a lot of Russian spy movies, so of course I think, is that like Dr. No, she's gonna get him like this and he's gonna be over. So there is this, it's almost a sense of a whodunit. Like where are they? And why does that have a point on the end of it? And you know, his work is always about making you question what you see and maybe what you know as well. There's a waste paper basket that's knocked over. So everything else seems like it's in place except there's scattered shoes. 
So, you know, they're, they're just wonderful stories. And um, anyway, so they're, they're worth it. This one is also very funny. It says social science, and it looks like, and it's got all these animals and all these figures and all these props. There's a Greek figure over there, and he's lost his head, like all the rest of the Greek sculptures. <laughs> And again, what's real and what isn't? There's another background that you can stand in front of. They really relate to films, our relationship to films, our relationship to moving parts, to story, um, to myth, and also to, to art. So in this case, we have failure. We have this figure that, this alligator that didn't quite cut the mustard, so he's in the trash can. So there's a very sad art maker there. It did work out. So, you know, these are really, you, you could look at these, each of these for probably an hour and make notes and, and end up with uh, really some really fascinating insights. So I also wanted to talk about um, that white one. Um, Roland did a series of uh, paintings which are not here but were in the last show that I saw that I, and there was a whole room full of these large scale white paintings that were a combination of very sparse kind of very zen, although they were more Chinese than Japanese. But to me, uh, they were very sparse and, and kind of wintry. But it, he was dealing with a whole different surface treatment. Because here, these, th this way of applying paint really reflects back to abstract expressionism, which was an art movement of the 1940s and put America on the map. It was when the center of art moved from Paris to America. And you know, everybody knows Jackson Pollock, but basically, those artists were dealing with paint as the subject matter. You actually weren't allowed to paint flowers or vases or anything. The paint itself, the movement of the paint, the gesture of the artist, it was paint as poetry. Roland used it, that line over there before, but the paint itself, the meaning of the painting was the paint. And so he is referring back to that, although he's doing it all white, and with a different intent. So a lot of these are combining the surface treatment of abstract expressionism, but with a subject which would have not have been ex uh, acceptable if you were an abstract uh, painter. Up until the early 60s, if you put figures back in your painting, uh, the New York critics considered it a failure of nerve. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was quite, so he's really talking about the canon, he's talking about art history. He's talking about who judges art. You know, what, what do critics know? Um, and so anyway, that's, I think that's about all I have to say. And so I guess, did you have? Well, any? I had a question about that. Okay. To me, to, to me, when I looked at it the first time, it gave me a sense of like Asian art. So I don't yes. know if there's a reference yeah. to that. Or this one is called American Still Life. Uh -huh. However, <laughs> which I did look it up because when I saw all the rest of this series, they were very Asian. And then I'm writing my notes, you know, I think I'm being so original. And then I come to the last painting in the room and it's called Chinese Landscape. You know, it was like, duh. I'm writing, this seems very Chinese. <laughs> yeah. And so, yes, I, I agree with you. But also, you know, I mean, not to, but you know, Roland is 90. And then to me, they, they, were, they were looking at kind of, not necessarily the end of life, but there was, some, there was kind of a wintry, a poignant, wintry feeling sure. to it. Oh. And I know, I know, it's like, I'm not that young either. So I mean, it's poignant and wintry for me too. But, <laughs> but yeah, so that's, that's how I saw that, those series. I thought they were really gorgeous. It's very hard to, to be that clear, that elegant, and that refined mm -hmm. as this whole body of work was. And it was very meditative. Mm -hmm. It was really just gorgeous. I felt like it needed benches in front of it mm -hmm. so that you could really be with the paintings. Mm -hmm. you know. And that's a bench. 